Pathfinder Adventure Card Game is one of the most versatile games in my closet in terms of the level of difficulty that can be put into the game when playing, whether playing solo or with others. And I'm showing you here the setup for a game that we'll be demonstrating here with playing four characters solo. A couple of points to make here before we get in. First of all, I added another character after thinking about it and this is one from the character add-on and I did that after looking through the rules and just reading a little bit about him I wanted to play him too he's a captain of the guard and really a warrior and we're gonna look here at his stats you can see he's gonna be rolling a d10 for strength and I don't think I have that in the rest of the party he is a male half-orc cleric and um, Basically, he is, as I said, a warrior, and um, there is a trading element in this game that hasn't been in the other games. I'm not quite clear what it is, but he deals with that, so um, I wanted to add him in, and I, I rearranged the locations accordingly, so I added the location that I needed to add for this amount in the party, for four in the party. I'm not going to go through the rules in general here. Um, I'm going to just show you a little bit of play and discuss the rules. I'll say my history with this game system is very um, uh, roller coastery. When the original set came out, Rise of the Rune Lords, in the fantasy setting, I had absolutely no interest. Well, I had like interest. I had a lot of interest and then I saw a video on it and my interest just plummeted because the person in the video spent a lot of time showing this kind of card and this kind of card really turns me off in a game because I don't like seeing the check marks I'm not gonna write on a card and while I appreciate the upgrade ability I just uh, it just didn't really sell me on it now of course um, to use this card if you were keeping with the adventure path situation and developing your characters all you need to do and all I do uh, with the mummy's mask version that I have is sleeve this and um, you can make off your check marks accordingly on your sleeve uh, so I never played the basic game I have a ton of games in the fantasy world and didn't feel the need to expand my offerings into this system when the uh, skull and shackles skulls and shackles came available for trade um, somebody I think offered it to me I don't think I sought it out I can't really remember but I said to myself whatever I'm you know happy to do this trade and get rid of whatever it was I was getting rid of I got that game and to my surprise I really enjoyed it and I think the reason that I there are a number of reasons why I enjoyed it one is just I like playing games with cards and when cards and dice together are the only elements in the game that um that speaks to me just from a physical component point of view. The other thing is that I think the game in a simple way asks of you to invest in with your imagination in the way that you're guided uh, by the story to invest yourself in it and to really just give yourself over to the concepts that are trying to be developed because the bottom line is you are going somewhere, you're reading something, you're rolling a dice. Going somewhere else, reading some, rolling a dice. I mean, that's what you're doing in the game, in essence. And to the extent that it becomes interesting, and we'll look at this when we look at the cards in my hand, uh, in my hands, to the extent that it becomes interesting to you, you have to really allow yourself to be involved in the cards and what each individual card means. There are, I think, 11 or so different card types in the game that include weapons, armor, allies, items of all different sorts, and allies of all different sorts. There are animal allies and people allies. And in the theme of the pirate one that I played, Pirate theme is not something that I have in many games. I have Blackbeard, and that's basically it. So uh, to develop that theme and to play, you know, with a parrot and um, whatever else you have in a pirate theme is terrific. And here, I certainly don't have any games whatsoever with this type of mummy tomb-like uh, theme. I guess I do actually. That's not true. I have the Tomb Raider collectible card game which if you watch my channel you know I traded for a while ago and thought I was going to do a video on and it's still sitting in my closet so I've got that but I don't really count that um, so 
getting into the theme and really exploring what the cards mean is key to my involvement in the game. I decided to play a fourth character because I want to see more of the cards and um, I want to experience that and maybe just show you more of the cards in this video. So I'll play a couple turns with the four characters as opposed to the three that I originally had set up. When I'm choosing the characters initially for something like this or even playing it with a group, I just do it randomly. Um, I don't actually try to set up a deck and build a deck in any way. I follow, of course, the card list in terms of the number of cards. So here's an example of every character is going to tell you what your starting card list is. And here we're starting basically at level one. Had we leveled up, this would be our a starting card list, etc. But um, we're starting here and I'm just pulling in. I set them up, you saw me do it, and I just completely randomly um, stick in those quantity of card types. Everyone has a favored card type and what this means is that when you draw your initial hand you're supposed to have a card of your favorite type in it and if you don't you reshuffle to get that in there. And the skills that everybody has listed are here with an indication of what die you are rolling to make the test of the skill. And the test is to meet or exceed a difficulty number that comes in on the card you're encountering. And we'll see how that works. Some people have an additional sub-skill. So for example, if she's in something with a keyword melee, she can roll her d8 and add a number two, uh, add two to her roll uh, for a strength value if the keyword melee is involved. And you can go through she's, and see how the character is meant, even without the little descriptor you have about the character. She's obviously an intelligent person and she has more arcane knowledge even with a d10. There are d12s in this game. She doesn't seem to have access to one right now at least. Everybody also has a hand size and they are given a proficiency in certain things which comes into play. Um, at various points and then um, you have these other uh, indications that frankly I often forget to check. This is the difficulty with playing with so many different characters because everybody's got the list of things and when you're going through you have to kind of refer back but that also obviously adds um, a richness to the experience and um, for example here you may recharge a card that means put it back into your draw pile that has the staff trait to add 1d8 to your combat check. So if she's carrying um, some type of staff and she's doing a combat check, she can get rid of that and um, roll a d8 and add that in. So that's an example of um, one of her skills. And when you're playing the game, when you're setting up the game, you're looking at this side of the card. And then during gameplay, you have this out to reference what um, attribute you're using or what skill you're using and what um, corresponding um, die you're choosing. And everybody, as I said, um, has their own card with different. So for example, his strength, he's rolling a d10. Um, his other uh, skills are listed here and his other, um, I guess they call them powers, are listed here. So I'm playing with, um, as mentioned, this female human Magus. And um, they all have Additionally, a little description of where they come from, who they are, and then this is their character card that you will be moving into various locations as you play. You can move, everybody can be in the same location, you can split up the party, and um, you know, any way you want, really. When you're in the same location, you may exchange cards, and that's that's another reason why I don't really bother to actually choose the cards when I'm just getting a game out and playing solo or in this case playing I'm this is the first time I'm playing this game um, I, I just want to see what the cards are I'm not worrying about maximizing my deck per se if I'm playing this game with my family or setting it up to play with my family who are generally non gamers I will try to set up decks for build decks for them at least we've done it with the other the pirates game we haven't played this yet uh, together um, I will try to set up decks for them that maximize their character so it's a you know it's an enjoyable rather than a frustrating experience and we don't have to spend a lot of time showing up in the same locations to change cards because that can be uh, irritating especially if you're a non-gamer 
So Simone here um, is this rogue, and you can see, for example, she's only rolling a d6 for strength. She has other skills. Um, she's highly dexterous, and she rolls a d12 for dexterity, and she has some additional benefits there, and um, you know, a different, a different powers as well. And also, of course, a different starting card list in terms of the balance of the cards. And we have finally Estra, and I just chose her because I like to I like the idea of playing with someone old. So she's a female human spiritualist, and um, well, she's old and smart, so good, for, good for her. She's got a D12 on wisdom, and she has even more knowledge of the divine, and well, knowledge of the knowledge, I guess. So, um, and she's charismatic. She's, I guess, oddly charismatic, given how she's pictured there. And here are some of her powers. We'll, we'll look at this when we're actually in playing the game. So this is my party. These are the locations. And in um, on the back of, so this is the rule book here. I don't remember whether they have this. It's a little hard to see. I don't remember whether they have this on the back of the skulls and shackles. There's a nice reference sheet here explaining what you are doing. It's a very basic turn sequence, but I'm going to put that up because, as I said, it's been a little while since I've played. The only other thing I need to mention to you here, I'll just scroll up to show you, is this. This is called the Blessings deck. Now, some of the cards in the deck are Blessings cards, and they are, as you would expect, very beneficial cards to you. And each Blessing has um, some powers that it does. In many cases, it allows you to do an extra. I'm not really going to go into this right now, but it allows you to do an extra action at a location, for example, or it will boost a die roll or something like that, something beneficial to you. But the blessings in this pile here, there are 30 of them randomly chosen. These act as a timing mechanism for the game. So at the beginning of every character's turn, you need to turn over one card in the Blessing deck, which is basically the passage of time. So in essence, what this is doing, and for the most part, it just moves in one direction. I think, um, I think in the Pirate version, there are some cards that uh, allow you to get more time. I can't really remember that. Maybe there are here too, we'll see. Um, but you must turn over a card and then do your turn. When it's another character's turn, turn over a card, do a turn like that. If the Blessings deck runs out before you finish your task, you have lost the game. So what is your task? Your task basically in um, any of the versions of the game you're playing, any of the various adventures, is the same. It is to chase down a boss monster and corner that boss monster in a location and destroy that boss monster. That boss monster. It's going to be thematic to the locales and the overall setting. And the monster is going to come with henchmen. And so what you do at the beginning of the game when you saw me setting up these uh, decks in the time lapse, what I was doing was looking at, this is an example of the ruined temple locale. And uh, if I can come into focus here, you'll see it tells you what is going to be within this deck list. Some of these things are bad, like monsters and barriers, and some of them are good, like spells and armor and items. There are specific um, attributes of each location, and again, this is where you are really required by this game to invest in it imaginatively. So you need to imagine that you're going into this ruined temple and uh, it's a ruined temple, so if you're playing a card that has the divine trait, which is a card trait that we'll see at some point, you have to bury it, which means you can't play it again. Um, and uh, we'll get to closing a location and permanently closing as it would turn up. But basically your goal is to be traveling around to the various locations, going through the deck, exploring them uh, by revealing cards in the deck, dealing with the cards, obtaining the cards if they're good, getting rid of them if they are bad, and eventually hunting down and getting rid of the, the henchmen and finding where the main um, villain has escaped to, cornering that villain and defeating that villain in that location. And in order to do that, you have to explore multiple locations and close them or permanently close them so the villain cannot keep running around 
to the various locations. That's the overarching goal in any of the um, stories that are set out. The game itself works by giving you um, what they call adventure paths and various sub-stories within. Um, so right now we are working with this one, All That Glitters Begets Gold, and it's explaining to us that we are um, basically um, landing somewhere and trying to do trading and exploring, etc. It's telling us what the locations are based on how many players we are playing with. So in this case, we decided to play with four players, so we needed to set up all of these locations, but not these two. And um, this is part of uh, building, this is one part, the first part of this adventure path, which is crossing the Pharaoh's land. So in the uh, bigger picture of the story, we are arriving somewhere eager to reach the riches promised in the tombs of Wati. Weeks of unforgiving desert lie before you. Learn to respect and harness the elements, else become consumed, etc. So there's a, there's a story here, a uh, light story, and um, then you are instructed to set it up as you, uh, as you do. It tells you how to complete the adventures and in what order, and these are all from, I believe these are all from the base game. And um, there are some specific adventure path rules that come into play. Again, I'm not going to get into this because it would it'd take too much explaining to see what it means, but um, when it comes up in the game, I will mention it. So you have the adventure path. It dictates your locations, which are in turn dictated by how many characters you're playing, and then the basic mechanic we shall see. You go somewhere, you pull a card, you deal with a card, you go somewhere else, you pull a card, you deal with a card. That's it. I did a little bit of reorganization and we're ready to go here. I, I play it in a limited space, so it's going to get messy as things go, especially playing four characters. I, I took a look at my characters and did a little bit of rearranging just to remind myself. Part of the problem when I play, um, let alone you know doing a video, is just remembering whose turn it is, and I'll put some marker out there. But I took a look and saw that, at least initially, I want to pair Estra. So Estra's interesting because Estra, let's see, just read you her little description here. Spent her youth playing, plying the trade of charlatan medium. Her seances were among the best, ignoring the minor detail that they were woven of lies. That changed when she met a knight named Honor. For a time they lived an honest life until he perished under the claws of a dragon. When she returned to the sideshow, her seances became real, summoning his spirit. Now she atones for her wrongs by contacting the dead on their loved one's behalf. She travels with, um, her favorite card is her spirit husband. So she travels with him and we'll see. Um, it needs to be drawn in the first hand and I didn't do that, but then I reshoveled. So I know I will draw him in the first hand as I need to because he is the favorite card type. But looking at her, her here, um, her, she's not very strong. She's rolling a d4 on strength and I want to pair her at least initially with uh, my strongest guy, this Drelm, who's got a d10 um, and then a melee strength of two. Now again, these the order that I have it here is not the order that ultimately they're going to be moving around these locations in. But right now, this is just to remind me of what I want to do. And when I start, I want him to be player number one. So I've got them organized in strength order. You certainly do not need to do this. And obviously, if you're playing with a group, you wouldn't be doing that. Um, she is a strength of D8. And um, she over here is a strength of D6. And I'm already feeling like if these ladies separate out, I don't know, there's going to be trouble. But I want to keep I want to keep her right now with him until I see how things develop. And so this is what I have done. To start the turn, you're going to be pulling in a hand uh, limit. Everyone has a different limit. It's usually either five or six to start. His hand size is five. And um, we will take a look at the, um, the five cards that he gets and um, where he's going to go. Now, again, due to space, it sort of looks like I already have them at locations. I don't. I mean... These are the locations. Nobody is anywhere yet. Um, I don't know. Maybe I will send him here just for ease of things, and I may need to move things around, but um, it, it might be a tad bit confusing. Um, but that's really due to the limitations of my 
space to film right now where I am playing. So let's just um, let's just scroll down here. I got the uh, cards off to the side here, and we'll see what we drew in. So this is again um, this is Drelm's initial his half or cleric his initial hand and we're just going to look at uh, what we got he needs to have a weapon in his hand to start and yes he does okay well he starts with a blessing blessings as i mentioned are um, give you different powers that you can typically re-roll a die so it's explaining to you here you can in the ways in which you can use it by adding um, a one die for if you want to get a fire trait onto something um, for some reason you can add two dice if you discard it to get add strength to a non-combat check etc um, you can also discard it to explore a location in the game you get one free exploration so you can go somewhere and turn over a card but once you've done that you can't re-explore the same location unless, for example, you have a card that lets you do it. So blessings, I don't know if they all, I think they all actually can be used to explore. Um, and furthermore, it says after you play this card, if it matches the top card of the blessings discard pile, recharge it instead of discarding it. Recharge means you put it back in your draw pile. That is significant because wounds in this game are absorbed by discarding cards. So if you need to take wounds, you need to be able to discard cards to account for those wounds. And if you don't have any cards to discard to account for the wounds, then you will die. So adding card, being able to add cards back into your draw pile or keeping them in your hand is, is very key to managing your health in the game. And again, what it's referring to is to remind you there's 30 cards, that's the timing mechanism, and when it is the beginning of his turn, which we'll just do now, we turn over the top card. If this card matches this card, which it does not, um, we would then be able to recharge this card, put it back in our draw pile after using it as opposed to discarding it. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Nevertheless, we do have this blessing that we could possibly use at some point. We have a weapon and um, the keywords on the term on the card will come into play interacting with other um, other cards. So for example there may be a um, uh, monster or there may be some type of barrier that you're trying to overcome that will say um, you know if it is a slashing if it's attacked by slashing you get extra or whatever something like that so we'll see how that works and then it will give you the powers and I won't go into the detail until I end up using it everything is going to have a check to acquire because these are the same cards that you will be encountering in the location so you when the cards are in your hand you ignore this when the cards are in a location you're exploring and you want to obtain it that's when this comes into play we have this spell called Remove Curse. Well, that sounds potentially pretty good. And we can see here um, some of the, the values, the traits that would potentially be on a card are going to be impacted uh, here with the powers. We have some armor. And um, reveal this card to reduce damage that's great because revealing just means you need to show it and have it in your hand you can put it right back in your hand you don't actually have to use it um, and it says if you're proficient with light armors and you may remember that um, our character card indicates what our proficiency is and in this case we are proficient with light armors so if we're proficient with light armors we can bury this card to reduce damage um, to us and um, also do an intelligence check to recharge it instead. So um, burying typically means it's out of the game, um, but recharging means you may get it back. You will get it back. You put it into your discard, or rather you put it in your draw. And we have an item here, a frost staff, and it will give us some powers, obviously, and we're back to the blessing. So we're, ha we're dealing with blessings, a weapon, we got a spell, some armor, and an item. This is our starting hand for our character, and I think I will just bring him up to the sulfur pits. Why not? Um, you can see what is potentially available here in the uh, location, and also um, it says on your check that has the acid trait, add one die. So 
Um, that's going to come into play it's thematic, it's a sulfur pit. So um, there's a bunch of monsters here, barriers, not so much good stuff. There's a weapon, a spell, an ally, and a blessing. But there are, you know, a four of the ten, four of the nine cards here are not good. So I would want to send my warrior in initially. I'm not going to send a vulnerable, certainly not going to send her. She's really vulnerable and uh, you know who knows about these ladies. They may join. So what we're going to do to send him in is we're simply going to use our free explorer to turn over the first card in here and see what it is. And it is an ally. It's a camel in fact. Let's pull this up here and check it out. Again, this is the first time I'm playing this game. So um, just that is. Um, it's an animal, it's a mount, and it's basic. I'm not sure what basic means, but uh, I guess I could look that up. To acquire it, we need to use a wisdom and survival check and roll a 7 plus. And uh, this will tell us what powers it has when we have the card, but right now we don't have the card. So what we're interested in looking at here is the top of the card. Now, of course, you are not forced to try to get every card that is in the deck and um, this is called a boon card, a positive card. If you attempt to get this card and you don't get it, you must discard it from the game. So there's a little bit of a risk involved. Um, if you attempt to get a negative card and you don't get it, you shuffle it back into the location deck. So, you know, there's that. Uh, but of course I'm going to try to get this using wisdom and survival and I refer to my character card and see um, well, for Wisdom, I'm rolling a d8. I don't have the Survival. Um, I'm assuming that Survival is a subcategory of Wisdom. I don't have that. Uh, so I'm going to be rolling a d8, and I see that the check here to acquire it is a 7. That's not going to be so likely for me to do if I'm just rolling a d8. So I want to turn to my hand and see, do I have something to help? And of course, I definitely have something to help because when you have a blessing, you pretty much are going to get some help. I could choose to use this blessing to help. Uh, let's see. I could discard this card to add one die and the fire trait to any check. Well, the fire trait's not going to help me. When it says add one die, what it means is add one die of the basic type that you are allowed to use. So in this case, if I discard this card to use my wisdom trait, I would be adding another d8. So I would be rolling two d8s to try to obtain this camel. Um, and there are other ways that you could use this to add two dice, etc. Um, you know, under usual circumstances in the game, I probably wouldn't do this. It's the first turn of the game, and blessings are things, you know, you like to have in your hand to, for emergencies, really. I can refer back to my character card on the other side of it to see how many blessings. I had four blessings to start with. Well, you know, that's pretty good. I have 15 cards in my hand my starting hand, and four of them are blessings. I'm a pretty fortunate guy. So you know what? I will use it. Why not? I'm going to have to discard this because uh, it does not match the top card. So I'm going to discard it. But what that means is it's going to give me an extra d8 to uh, roll to try to get a seven or better to get this camel into my hand. So let's just, why not? <sighs> That's why not. That's exactly why not. So guess what? Didn't happen. What this means is we lose the camel. I'm pretty sure this just gets discarded from the game as a whole. I will confirm that, which means it gets tossed back in the box. And um, I will say that there uh, is a um, mechanism, if you're playing this game overall as per the rules, there are there's a difference between getting rid of a card from your adventure path and sort of getting rid of the card permanently, uh, as it were, you know, never to be used again kind of thing. I don't really do that because I don't play the game consistently enough to have that make sense. And, um, I, you know, when I'm done with whatever I'm doing, so for example here, I'm going to be playing some initial turns with you. I will probably continue on and play these characters through a couple of adventures to get them leveled up and then put this away and then maybe come back to it, you know, and play it with some family members and let them use the developed characters. 
what you're supposed to be doing, again, is encountering certain cards in the game that then get banished forever, and that adds a level of decision-making because if you attempt to acquire something and the penalty is banishment forever, it might impact your choice. Again, I don't do that, um, but that is part of the rule. So be that as it may, we just saw uh, an initial magnificent fail. I didn't get the camel. I wasted a blessing, and um, that was my first turn. So I don't have any other cards in my hand right now that will let me continue to explore the location. So I'm basically done with my turn and moving on to um, Estra, who I have here. I want her to travel with me. I don't know why, I just do. So I'm going to bring her over to this location. And the first thing that I do here, let me just sort of clean this up a little bit. Um, the first thing I do is I, so this is my blessing discard, I need to turn over the blessing deck and not forget to do that, which can happen. And then I will be drawing up her hand. Uh, let's see, this is why I don't tend to do more or less playthroughs. All right. Her hand size is five, and uh, let's see, as I said, I pre-reshuffled um, uh, here so that I know that I will be getting her required husband. Um, I just stuck that in, and then I did it randomly. So he should be, maybe this is him? Here he is. So you're required to have him in your hand at the outset, and I haven't actually looked at him yet, so let's see what he, what he offers. Um, he is an ally, an undead phantom, Owned by Estra. Put this card on top of your deck to draw a spell from your discard pile. Put this card on top of your deck to add 1d10 and the undead trait to your strength, constitution, and perception. When you would discard, this card is damage, recharge, instead. And that's pretty good. So basically, um, what this is saying is it's like he, you can keep using it because it's you're putting it on top of your deck to do that putting it on top of your deck to do that. Um, and here, you're recharging it, which is putting it on the bottom of your deck. So I understand why. Well, that's actually really great. Um, so he is, um, though she only has the strength of a D4, for example, that concerned me, with him, she's actually going to be adding a D10. So in fact, that's pretty awesome. Um, great. Well, I didn't know that. And uh, let's see what else she has here in her hand. She drew in a spell, a uh, cure, that's sounding pretty good. Um, this is an example of how the cards are involved with healing. The cure spell, it's a magic divine healing spell, and what it says is reveal this card, so you don't have to get rid of it, and choose a character at your location to shuffle 1d4 plus 1 random cards from his discard pile into his deck and then discard the card. Shuffling uh, cards into your deck, so it's going to be a minimum of two if you have a bad roll and a maximum of five, that's giving you more cards to potentially not only draw into your hand, but to discard for wounds, to account for wounds. So that's very good. Um, and then it says, after playing this card, if you do not have the divine skill, banish it. That means take it out of the game forever. And... Um, Otherwise, you can do a Divine 8 check to recharge it. Do we have the Divine skill? Yes, we do. So this is where you can see, now this was just random. As I said, I didn't build my decks together. If you're somebody who wants to really get into deck creation, um, there's hundreds of cards in this game, and you can go through them all and sort of pair them up. I just got lucky here, I guess, because this was totally random. Um, I do have the Divine skill, so when I'm done playing this, I can attempt to do a Divine 8 check to recharge it instead of discarding it. And again, recharge means put it in the bottom of my draw pile. And... Um, a divine eight check, I'm actually, my divine skill is pretty high, so I will be rolling a d12 plus two to get eight or better. So that's pretty good. Um, so that's the spell I've got. So far, I'm really happy with my hand. I've got another spell, Acid Jet. This is an attack spell, obviously, and I can use this to um, use for a combat check instead of my strength. I can use my arcane or divine skill plus 1d6. So that's pretty good. And then if the thing I'm fighting has a certain type of trait, I can add another 1d6. That's really good. And I know because I set up 
um, well, this, you know, th this was random, but I know because I set up the adventure that um, the henchmen in this are called construct. So I'm going to guess that they have this construct trait. So old Estra here, she could actually become pretty important to the success of this adventure. Um, again, after playing this card, etc. So this, I'm pretty happy right now. Porcupine, that's cute. Uh, this is an ally, an animal ally. And let's see, recharge this card to add 1d8 to your check against a Bane that has the animal check. Okay. And I can also use him to explore. Oftentimes allies will also let you do an extra uh, exploration again, as do the blessings. Here's another blessing. And we see this blessing of the elements here is um, we get to discard it to add one die to any check or recharge it, you know, with certain things. So, uh, so far I'm very, very happy with the hand that I drew for old Estra and um, let's see do I feels like I actually took too many cards hang on let's see she's got a hand size of five one two three four five no that's right all right so back to our big fail with Drelm this big guy he must be sort of embarrassed I guess I'm embarrassed on his behalf. What can I say? I'm going to bring old Estra in here. I'm going to stick with my concept of keeping them together, even though now, <laughs> now I'm feeling like she perhaps is the leader here. Uh, and I'm going to have to be careful to keep this orderly because um, that is a problem sometimes. So she's going to do an exploration. It's a free exploration. And to do that, you simply just um, turn over the top card of the deck. And right away, we have what I was just referring to, this henchman, this mining construct. It is a construct. I didn't really want to encounter this right away, but it is what it is. Um, so we have to defeat this in combat by rolling a 10 or more. And let's see, it's immune to the mental and poison traits. If defeated, you may immediately attempt to close this location. If defeated by less than six, you may also draw an item from the box. Okay. Um, now, Let's see. I need to check. Sorry, this is combat of 10. I think that is going to be referring, it's not specified, but the combat of 10 is going to be her strength attribute, I think. Let's just see. All right. Sorry about that. I wanted to just do a continuous filming, but I, I had to really check on this. I remember being confused with this in the other game that I'm playing. So we're here referencing the rules, page 11. Um, and it says, most monsters and some barriers call for a combat check, blah, blah, blah. If you aren't playing one of those cards that says something specific, which this did not, it just said combat check, you must use your strength or melee skill. So um, I am correct in that. So the basic skill we're gonna have to use for this is our strength, which is a D4, and we need to roll a 10 or more to overcome it. So clearly that's not going to be enough. And we're going to have to bring in, at the very least, this acid jet spell, because it says, for your combat check, discard this card to use your arcane or divine skill uh, plus 1d6. And it says if the Bane has the construct or ooze trait, which it does, I um, can't find it easily right now, but it does, add another 1d6. So what we're getting here is we are able to use our arcane or divine skill. We have a divine skill. So we've got a d12 uh, plus 2. So we've got a D12 plus 2 plus 1D6 and another 1D6. I mean, that's uh, like overkill here with this acid jet. So I guess the question is, um, are, do we want to use this acid jet spell right now? I guess we do because it's the henchman and we could potentially close this location. So um, let me find that card to show it to you. Um, again and just confirm that we want to do that. So here we are. This is one of the henchmen and um, it's immune to mental and poison traits. Well, uh, that's not a poison trait. Doesn't, I don't have that there. And I'm guessing wisdom, oh, that's not a trait, that's a skill. So, okay. If defeated, you may immediately attempt to look, close this location 
if defeated by less than six, you may also draw an item from the box. Okay, well, I'm guessing we're going to do overkill, so that won't happen, but um, let's do it. Let's use our acid jet, which is going to allow us to roll um, what we're coming up with here. We're coming up with a d12 plus two d6s, and uh, let's get our d6s and our d12, and then on top of all of that, we're going to add two. So this is what we're rolling to get 10 or better, and um, yeah. So, you know, i got to say, we're not rolling, so, really not rolling so great here, but that was, of course, enough. Um, and we rolled 15, so we have defeated this, and actually, you know what? We did defeat it by less than six, so we can get an item from the box. That's awesome. So we're going to draw an item from the box randomly, and um, I'll just show you. Here's the box. Our items are, where are our items? Just going to take, I had sort of pre-sorted these. We're just going to take the one in, one in front here. We're going to get a Twitch Tonic. This is an alchemical liquid. Discard this card to examine the top card of your location deck, then explore. Banish it to draw some allies from our discard pile. Well, that's pretty good. I would probably save it for that. Um, all right, so we got that. We can add that to our hand. And we indeed are going to attempt to close this location. And to do that, uh, we need to refer to the location card itself. We're in the sulfur pits here. And... Um, when closing, you are dealt one acid damage. Well, that's too bad. Um, on your check that has the acid trait, add one die. I need to look at the rules here and see clearly um, if what I'm missing because um, I thought it would tell me more of what to do. Usually, usually you have to succeed at a check. So for example, here's the precious mines. It says when closing, succeed at this, etc. Um, the quarry, succeed at succeed at Mary Blessing. Maybe that's all we have to do, just take one acid damage. So um, to take an acid damage, we need to discard a card. Um, that's kind of a bummer, but you know, hey, we got a card, so it's all, all fair. I'm not going to discard this one probably, but I'm going to confirm that and uh, come back. All right, well, looked up the rule, and um, indeed, we can close this location. Um, so to close this location in this case, what we do simply is we turn over the car to its inactive side, and we can read some descriptive text here. Um, and the black and white side lets us know this location is closed. Lost to us are all the potential good cards in the stack of the location, but also the bad cards are there too. Um, so the location is closed, and we must take, per the instruction here, one acid damage. Now, as mentioned, taking damage means you have to discard a card. It's the beginning of the game. I've only got these four cards in my hand. I don't want to discard any of them. I just got this tonic, um, and I don't want to discard this tonic cure. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is to help uh, somebody. Definitely not getting rid of that. Porcupine. Maybe, maybe getting rid of this cute porcupine guy. He lets me explore, and I can recharge him to add a D8 to my check against a Bane that has the animal trait. Well, that's actually pretty good, because as you recall, um, you know, my strength is a D4. My baseline strength is only a D4, so I might want to keep that. Uh, blessing. Well, again, uh, this is sort of has more flexibility in terms of what I can um, help myself with. But here, discarding this card to add one die to any check, if I was comparing these two as an example and needing to call upon one of them in a combat situation where I'm using strength, this guy, this porcupine, is actually going to help me more because he'll let me add a d8, whereas here I have to go to my baseline die, which is a four, a d4. Um... I'm going to get rid of this blessing. Uh, let me just see how many... Uh, I can check back at my values here to see in my baseline deck I had four blessings and three allies. Well, 
I don't know, I like this porcupine. I like this guy. I like traveling with animals. And um, I'm going to toss the blessing into my discard as uh, that is the way I take in a wound. So I have the acid damage. And the acid part of it comes would come into play if I had some, um, say, particular power or whatever that had something to do with reducing acid damage or whatever. Um, I don't. I can discard a spell to reduce other damage dealt by three. Well, that would be for a lot of damage. Um, now uh, we are moving on to our, I gotta straighten things up here. We're moving on to our next character. And this is, let's check her out. She is, um, I'm not gonna pronounce her name, female human Magus. That's how you even pronounce that. Um, let's read, you can see her, I won't read this to you, but if you want to see what her background is, you can pause it here and check that out. She is, we're going to remind ourselves of her, uh, she's got a hand size of six, proficient with light armors. She's rolling a d8 on strength, and if she's in melee, she adds a couple, so that's good. d6 on dexterity constitution, she's pretty smart. Um, she's got intelligence, but not a lot of wisdom, so, um, I'd have to look up and see how they define the difference between those two things. Um, now, on your check, after the roll, you may discard a card to add or subtract two from the result. This is really good to remember because it is uh, check neutral. So it seems like I have the capacity to change uh, a roll to my favor if I'm willing to discard a card. When you would discard a spell for a power that has the staff trait, you may recharge it instead. That's also important to remember. Again, forgetting these things is really, for me, one of the hardest things about this game. This game isn't particularly complex, um, but it's these details, especially when I'm running four characters, that um, I can really, uh, I don't, you know, damage myself because these are powerful, powerful powers. And I can recharge a card that has a staff trait to add one D8 to my combat check. Again, got to remember that. Let's draw up her six cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, and see actually what is she. I need to check. This is our first draw. So we need to make sure she got, um, well, a card that has a staff trait. That makes sense. So let's see what we get with her. And um, well, right away we have an explorer staff. So there you go. That's her weapon. Now, again, um, I just drew, I don't, I don't know this set, so I don't know how many of the weapons have the staff trait. I happen to, um, you know, I just drew these randomly. You saw me do it on the uh, time lapse without checking and just doled them out. She happened to get what she needed. Um, I suppose if she didn't, I'd have to go back and, um, you know, where I would have to go back and substitute that out. But that wasn't the case here. So um, she got what she needed here. And this has uh, melee, bludgeoning, it's two-handed, and it's a basic weapon. Um, and it lets me use strength or melee plus 1d6. Well, that's pretty good. And we just need to reveal it. We don't even have to get rid of it. That's pretty awesome, actually. She has an augury spell. It's magic, arcane, divine traits and um, we can examine cards in our location deck. Well, that's awesome as well. Acute Senses spell. Um, display this card next to the character's deck. While displayed, adds one die to his perception checks. Uh, let's see, what is our perception value here? Are we perceptive? Uh, you know, we don't have perception, so I don't know what we would use that for? Well, I didn't need to clarify how that would work. Um, this may be an example of a card that I put in my deck that I can't actually use, but of course it's not in vain because I could always use that to discard for a wound. Um, at the end of your turn, if you do not, blah, blah, blah. All right, I have to look into the perception thing. Can't quite remember that now. We'll do that. And another spell, Acid Splash, Magic Arcane Acid Attack. Uh, we can discard it to use our arcane skill plus 1d6 for a combat or disable check. And, um, well, that's that would help us out because our arcane, which we do have, is uh, better in our strength. Again, um, you know, had we not had this, it would have been a useless card to us. Um, and that is some of the danger of doing this randomly. Unshakable Chill. We got a lot of spells here. 
Magic Arcane Divine Attack, Cold and Basic. Discard, somewhat similar actually. And a uh, Potion of Healing. Banish this card means taking it out of the game forever. Uh, choose a character at your location to shuffle 1d4 random cards from his discard into his deck. So that's nice. All right. This is what we've got with our character here. And we need to figure out where we're going to be going. Um, looking at the available options, I see in this quarry, and I'm noticing here we're adding three to our check that has the bludgeoning trait. I have to check whether this is a benefit to us or a detriment because I'm um, just reading it this way. I'm not quite sure. Are we getting to add three with a bludgeoning trait? In which case that's good because we have this uh, staff with bludgeoning or does it mean that if we encounter a card with bludgeoning, it's harder? Um, I don't really know what would that would be or make sense thematically. So if I go there or when I go there, I'll have to figure that out. We've got the precious mine. A um, couple monsters, barriers, weapons. There's a bunch of items here. I like items. Um, this is again mentioning the construct trait, which is possibly likely because that is what uh, the henchmen have, as we saw. The ruined temple. This is the one uh, when you play a card that has a divine trait, we have to bury it. This may be a good place to go because we, I don't think think she really had a lot of cards, at least in her hand right now, or maybe any. Well, that is divine. All right, I'm wrong about that. Oh, we had a few. Uh, the spells have divine. Uh, let's keep looking. Stonework passages. Um, damage dealt to you is reduced by one. Well, that's nice. And a couple monsters, barriers, a weapon, a spell, armor. It's not a lot here but our damage is going to be reduced. I guess we're going to be in sort of protected mode by those passages and volcanic vents. This doesn't look good. Monsters barriers, there's weapons available, spell armor, blessing. Monsters are immune to the poison trait. Um, and when closing, each character is dealt one fire damage. Let me just see. Um, we didn't have, did we have poison? No, we didn't could be using those spells there. I think that's what I'm going to try to do, because at least in my hand right now, I'm not holding anything with a poison trait, so I could be using my, um, I could be using these spells, this acid and these types of things. Um, so maybe we will set off to this really um, bleak looking volcanic vents area where we could potentially encounter one of three monsters plus of course who's ever lurking there uh, henchmen or whatever and um, potentially pick up a weapon a spell some armor an item or a blessing so i think we'll do that and um, i gotta get some of this video off my phone and come back and see what happens I didn't quite realize how long this video had gotten, so I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit, just get through everybody's first turn here. We have um, previously drawn these six cards and examined them, looked at the locations, and I think I decided that I'm going to go to these uh, volcanic vents because when I encounter uh, monsters here, they're going to be immune to poison trait, and right now at least I'm holding things that don't have that trait. So I'm going to go there and draw in the first card here, explore, and we see we have found some armor. And this is light armor, and um, we need to use our constitutional fortitude check against a six to acquire it, and it gives us some benefits. Um, we get to recharge this to um, reduce certain types of damage, which is actually pretty cool because um, we don't lose it that way and we could banish it to reduce damage by five. That's actually a very good piece. The problem is we don't really, let's see, what do, what, it's a constitution and fortitude check of six and our constitution, yeah, it's, yeah our constitution is a six, a d6 roll and we don't actually have anything. We're not having any blessings here. If I had a blessing, I could use it. Um, but nothing I have is going to help me. So basically, we are uh, we got to roll a six on a d6. Otherwise, we're just going to have to send this off uh, to the box for the rest of the game. So we're rolling our d6, and uh, obviously no. So we're banishing this card, unfortunately. But we did begin to explore this location, and that was her turn. Oh, I forgot. I need to uh, turn over a blessing. 
card to mark the time. And now for the last character in our party, I'm going to remember to do the turning over the blessing first and to mark the passage of time. And we will draw up her cards. I think she also has a hand size of six. And uh, this is our female rogue. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see what she's carrying here. She has this Blessing of the Ancients, and um, I don't know whether you noticed this, but when I quickly uh, did the timing mechanism, this is uh, matching in the timing mechanism. So what that means is after we play this card, if there's a match, we can recharge it instead of discarding it so we can put it back in our draw pile. That's actually really great because it certainly is incentive to use this blessing and whatever is going to happen. We have a weapon here, a fire lance. And oh, we have another blessing. This one doesn't match, so we wouldn't, um, wouldn't get that benefit there. And we have this weapon, which is a certain type of slashing knife ranged weapon and uh, again trying to speed things up won't read that an ally card I think this might be the first ally card that we have encountered this is an undead incorporeal ghost display this card while displayed you may recharge this card to examine the top card of your location deck and put that card on the top of the bottom of its deck well that's pretty cool um, that's actually a pretty cool benefit. And we have another weapon. We have a whip here. Uh, we go back to this and just see. Uh, we can examine the top card of the deck, put it on the top or the bottom. When displayed, we can recharge it. Um, I don't know if that would come into play necessarily. Uh, this basically lets us do a little additional explore. So if we if we did some explore somewhere, wherever we went to, um, we could look at the card and see what we felt about it and then either put it on the bottom or not. And um, why not? Why not? So we're going to display our ally here. And I still haven't really decided where we're going to go. Um, I'll just stick, we're going to stick these ladies together for the time being. So this means she's also going to go off to the volcanic vents. And what we get to do right now is look at this top card and decide whether we want to um, encounter it or put it underneath. And uh, this is a Hunga Munga weapon. It's a ranged axe and it is, uh, it requires dexterity and range or range to acquire a check of nine. I'll have to look at my skills and um, for my combat check reveal this card to use my strength plus 1d6 well it's a weapon it's a good weapon and let's see let's check in on our stats here so we're looking to see uh, dexterity or ranged and uh, we do have ranged here so we've got a d12 plus 2 that's pretty great uh, and we need a 9 to acquire it and remember not really going to lose much by uh, playing this card. I mean, I'll have to, um, I will have to uh, 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 recharge the card, so put it at the bottom of my draw, but I'm not going to lose it um, to add one die to my check. Why not? Um, why not do that? So that will basically be adding one of my basic die, which in this case, um, yeah, that's her, uh, which in this case is going to be the d12. So that's basically rolling 2d12 plus 2 and just coming up with a 9. So let's go ahead and do that um, and uh, see if we can acquire that weapon. And off to the side we got a uh, 6 and a 4 is a 10. And you know, we're not really, not really uh, exceeding these things so great. 10, anyway, we rolled a 12. Uh, we did use this and um, we will be acquiring this weapon and we're going to be placing that right into our hand and then we will be taking our blessing here and we will be um, recharging it at the bottom which means placing it at the bottom of our draw deck as such and uh, let's see what do we need to do with this ally can we keep her out I think we can keep her out um, so that is the conclusion of the first round of play. We did acquire a weapon here. We did a little exploration and um, we're off on our adventure.
A couple of points I want to make about the system. This is potentially a very portable game. So I've got the stack here after I finished one adventure path. And really, this is all you would need to take with you once you sorted it out, obviously, and got it together, and your dice and, you know, perhaps the rule book. So it's actually a very portable game. And for those of you who travel, as I do occasionally, and want to bring something that could be potentially for, you know, a family game, this is this is a great option. Of course, you have to spend some time at the outset, at home, getting it together. And this is something else that I do when I am playing this game or the pirate version of it. At the end of the session, whatever it is, I set up the next session. So I build in whatever cards I have acquired. I set up um, locations for however many characters I think I might be playing, and I set up the character deck. So it's a little bit of work at the end, but usually at the end I'm involved in the game still and kind of remember, oh, I get an extra item here or whatever. And that kind of maintenance happening at the end of a session so that when I come to the box to play it, which sometimes I'm going to be doing solo, sometimes I'm going to be doing with other people, I can just get right into it. I pull out the stack and it's all set up to go. And I do recommend that because before I started doing that, there was a little bit more of a barrier to entry to getting the game back out. The other thing I wanted to show you here just a little bit are some of the uh, some examples of some of the cards from this set that we didn't see and that I think that I enjoy or um, just want to show you what they have. So for example, this stone weasel ally is great because what it does, you know, very thematically is that it will allow you to, well, it allows you to reduce some damage, but more to the point that if you are discarding, it allow you to explore a location and then it gives you just a little bit extra in your um, checks to acquire items. So it's like it's this little guy sort of ferreting things out potentially for you. And that's a great example of a card where the values make sense. I know I there's a lot of text on these cards and um, this gets back to the point of the game really gives you back a little bit what you put in. So. Um, if you spend time to think about what that actually means, then this card goes from being just a basic picture with some text to actually a little representation of an actual living being. And just a couple more allies to show you. I'm always a big fan of the animal ally. Here is a Hyannon Don, um, and it tells you what you get for this, and you basically it's like foraging for you in a way, so you get to um, uh, get to recharge some random card from your discard pile, so that's nice. It doesn't maybe have a lot of care in doing that, but it is going to be helping you out. Here is a Tomb Raider who you could um, encounter, and to acquire him, you need to use your Charisma, Diplomacy, or Acrobatics values. Again, that really makes thematic sense, and he is going to help you in some type of non-combat situation with dexterity because presumably he knows the setting, the knows the situation that you are in. Here is a camel ally and as you might expect it's going to help you when you are traveling around and doing exploration. There's the camel. And of course again thematically the check to acquire, well so the survival check to acquire makes a lot of sense there. Wisdom, knowledge of the area, etc. Here's an embalmer, another ally, um, and he is going to give you a little bit of smarts in um, an intelligence check. Fire gecko. There is um, a lot of uh, fire, electric acid damage that can happen in this game, and he is going to help you when you need to have a fire trait added to, say, uh, a weapon that you're using or whatever. So that's actually going to come in very handy and doesn't really take too much to acquire him. A wisdom or survival check of four. Some more animals. We look start now at uh, some items that you could pick up. This ghost battling ring, for example, perhaps left behind by somebody. And um, this is going to help you when you encounter the undead and it's going to give you a benefit there as you might expect. 
Here's a key, nice key here, and um, again, the checks to acquire make sense in terms of what it is. It's a magic object that somebody left behind, and it is going to aid you with barriers. We didn't see a lot of barriers, or any actually, in the limited um, play that I showed you. I will pull up a barrier card here and show that to you, show you a couple of those. Here's a compass. That's obviously going to help in movement. Smoke glass goggles, I like these. And, oh, I, that got mixed in. Let me find some barrier cards here. All right, here's some barrier cards. Again, very thematic, falling rubble. These are obstacles that you need to overcome in some way, and it will tell you what the check to defeat them are, of course, as you would expect with falling rubble, dexterity, acrobatics, perception, survival. And then it will tell you what happens if you uh, are unsuccessful in defeating it, that in this case, falling rubble, everybody is going to suffer from this. And um, in certain cases, such as this one, if you don't defeat it, you need to leave it basically for the next group of characters to come through. So it just doesn't get um, tossed or doesn't get shuffled back in, but it's actually the active barrier to get into the location. There's dry quicksand here and uh, same thing, there's some ongoing effect if you cannot defeat that. The evil eye. We didn't talk about scourges in this game, and this is actually a good lead-in to, uh, let me just show you here, collapsing scaffolding is an example. I'm going to get back to the scourge, and again, um, it tells you, typically with these barriers, it acts as some ongoing, ongoing event. That's not a barrier. So, this scourge, uh, the reference here to the scourge, um, this is a new um, rule, I guess you'd call it, or um, you know, mechanic in this set. And I'm going to just turn to the rule book here to show you so I don't uh, have to go through all the cards, although I will show you a scourge card at some point. I will say about this game, um, as I'm trying to find this, if you are someone who does not want to end up, for example, having to get a stack of cards at the end of the game like this and sort them back out, um, this game might not be for you. There's a lot of card sorting in here to prepare the decks and to clean up at the end. Of course, the box allows you, and you certainly should, keep the cards by card type. And um, the card types are generally fairly well differentiated, as you can see here. But um, there is a lot of sorting through, particularly for non-gamers who aren't used to this kind of thing. Um, I've had uh, people helping me sort the game out and be kind of shocked at the work that is involved. So if you're using this as a game to introduce to non-gamers, which I think um, it is a very effective in doing, that is perhaps one of the biggest challenges that somebody might face, and indeed as a gamer uh, to be prepared for that because it happens. Now I'm looking here at the rule book to show you Typically with these, all of these rule books, they will uh, highlight new types of mechanisms and in, this, in whatever game you're playing of the series here, for example, that was not in a previous iteration of the game. So for example, um, this is showing you, take a look at this here, that um, there are some cards require you to shuffle your own character token into a location deck, which is kind of cool. You shouldn't know where your token card is while you're shuffling. When your token is encountered, um, you know, you remove it and place it at the location and then there is an effect. So this is an example of how they treat a new, there's something new in this game. And there's also a trigger trait here. And this is uh, something on the card that will happen when you examine the card and it's listed on the card and it happens right up there. So um, you have to do that first. And in this case, this is like a trap card that has a specific trigger trait. There are also, um, looking for, the trading, you know, there's no index in this. Generally these rules are pretty clear, but they don't have an index and that in this particular case is a little frustrating. 
that took me far too long to find. So there are what they call support cards. Scourge, Trader, Bazaar, Defensive Stance, and Cohort. I'll just to show you a, uh, the, um, the Scourge card and the Trader card. So these are basically curses that you can encounter. And there are likewise cards that will remove a curse. And you can pick these up during the course of your adventure. And then they're an ongoing effect that will impact you negatively. So for example, this curse of vulnerability um, makes it impossible for you to reduce acid, cold, electricity, or fire damage that is dealt to you. And of course, this is going to be happening as you see and travel throughout the world. This is going to be happening a lot, and you will have many cards that can mitigate it. But if you're cursed, you cannot use them. So um, if you're cursed, you have to find a way to get rid of that curse. And as I said, there are cards that can be discovered to get rid of it and other powers that uh, characters may have to help you get rid of that. There are also traders that you can encounter, and um, of course you can trade cards with uh, members of your party at the same location, but there are also traders that you can encounter and basically give away cards for something else. So you could give this fellow two boons and get some spells. Um, and so there is a few different traders who are offering different types of things, and I think this adds a nice mechanic to the game. It makes it a little more interactive um, in terms of when you're traveling through the world, not simply just knowing what you are encountering in the location, but some of those cards will then pull in other effects like the Scourge, for example. So those are a few of the new details in this set. And um, again, I think um, for the person who is a solo player who sometimes maybe plays with others and perhaps maybe plays with others who are not gamers. That's sort of my theme here with this and that's probably just the way I use it. But um, this is, I wouldn't really call it a gateway game. Um, I, I don't even actually know what that concept means to me. Uh, but I would call it a game that um, for me has the capacity to be engaging enough if I'm running four different characters or three different characters or whatever just to remember all the different skills that they have to potentially spend time creating the character decks before I play to really maximize the interaction uh, among the cards in one deck and then also interaction among the various characters that I'm pulling in. That type of game involvement is gameplay of course and that is something that when I have the time and inclination is quite enjoyable to me so I can do that and then play through whatever scenario I am in. Alternatively, if I feel like just pulling up some, everything can be random. You just take your characters, you take your cards, you populate the um, locations and you get going. Now, there is, I won't say that it's quick to do that because there's a certain amount, again, of just sorting through all the cards and getting them into the locations, but it can be relatively mindless, for example. You can do that while you're, you know, watching TV or something if you're not actually uh, building the character deck. So there's different ways to get into the game that way. And as I said, uh, from my experience, this has been of pretty much all the games that I have, this series of games um, has been the one that I've been able to explain quickly and get almost total non-gamers to sit down for an hour or so and play through with a small group and uh, particularly if you hand them a deck of cards and they don't have to do the kind of game maintenance the pre-game maintenance I guess you'd call it to get the deck together it the barrier to entry is pretty low, at least for an evening. You know, is that going to turn them into a gamer? That's what I think of a gateway game if you're trying to turn somebody into a gamer. I'm not trying to do that, <laughs> but sometimes I'm trying to play a game with some friends who don't really play games and have no concept that um, adults even do this kind of thing, and I have found that the Pathfinder series is great for that, and it also finds me um, with my level of gaming interest, it provides enjoyment and challenge um, for me in a solo mode. So there's a look at the um, Mummy's Mask version of the Pathfinder adventure card game. I guess the other thing I wanted to point out, and obvious, this will be obvious to you if you know the series, is that with all of these series, they come with the ongoing adventure packs that you can purchase. And um, I find, I, you know, I have a bunch of like Lord of the Rings Living Card Game, and I have a bunch of, I have Arkham Horror Card Game. 
the living card games to me um, that can get a little overwhelming but the adventure packs here they come in boxes like this and they're you know individually sold you just fold them in as you move through so it's very linear in that regard and one might say perhaps it is less intricate or less I don't know if you could say, well, maybe less challenging. Provides new everything and um, new locations, new challenges to go, and it all integrates. For me, um, this is a sort of less pressure, I guess, what you could say. With Lord of the Rings and Arkham Horror, I do have um, a couple of the sets that have come after the base set, but I feel like a huge amount of pressure to keep up, and it, that just doesn't work for me in terms of the amount of time I have for gaming or even my interest level but for something like this um, it's a lot easier because I don't have to uh, worry too much about doing anything except just integrating them and you can uh, very effectively play without bothering to um, actually do your deck construction and you just fold the new stuff in and um, you do need to maintain the linear progression because what will happen is, uh, for example, this is Adventure Deck 1, Adventure Deck 4. As you move through the decks, you will realize that certain cards tell you to increase the difficulty level, say, of acquiring something by the adventure number. As well, if you are developing your characters or as you're moving through and developing your characters and you are gaining more skills, um, you're basically needing to do this to level up, to keep up with the challenge level that the new cards are providing you. So there's a little bit of that that needs to happen. And as I said, the way I would handle that is by sleeving this and just putting check marks off as I developed the character. Do you have to do that? No. I mean, you could buy these and just for the new cards basically and, and put them in and just ignore any instruction that tells you to add the adventure number on if you weren't developing any characters and if you were not um, playing along with the adventures you could certainly do that. So there is a look inside Pathfinder the adventure card game and I have hoped you enjoyed it and as always thanks for watching.